think we're gonna come back. This is like too outrageous. New York is too much for my nerves. Okay, to summarize the departure of Phil, uh, Louis, and Peter. Let, let me be very clear about this. Whatever happened, Mark was completely aware of it and in agreement with it. There was never any question on who was working for who. In other words, I worked for Mark and Mark could have fired me anytime he wanted. So whatever decision was made, was was Mark's decision of where he envisioned the band was going. I can tell you there was no creative differences with Phil. There was a creative difference with Peter. And uh, and as far as Louis was concerned, they just did not, they didn't gel. I mean, it, it, I, I don't think it was anything more than that. Again, stress this: all of all of this was Monk's decision. It wasn't it wasn't something that I was the Svengali and I came up with 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 all the stuff. I had really nothing to do with that. I mean, I I, I had opinions certainly, but but I didn't make the decision. I like, I, I frankly like Peter's playing. Check one, two. Hey, one, two, one. Please welcome from New York City, Ryan. <laughs> Riot uh, Fire Down Under, when I put the needle down on the vinyl, immediately I, I, I sensed the, the influences that I, that I grew up with, some Edgar Winters, some Montrose, uh, also the British Invasion uh, style rock metal, and uh, I admire the album to this day, I actually have it in the cantina downstairs, and uh, I put it on the turntable from time to time to go back and listen to those glory days. There was no money made during Rock City and during Narita. Absolutely no money. All money, or any kind of money that was that was generated, was was thrown back into the band in order to make a deal in the United States. There's just something about that album with the seal head and the dude and the fire behind it. You know, I mean, that to me was the album, and that was the one my brother loved and listened to so much, so that's why it stuck out in my mind. Had rep they had legal representation because whether they know it or not, a contract is not even enforceable unless both sides have legal representation. Riot Fired and Under with Guy Speranza is, is probably one of my all-time favorite albums. Run For Your Life, Outlaw, you know, Swords and Tequila, Altar of the King, feel the same. Just great melodies, great, great rock and roll, great heavy rock. A great band. Um, you know, they played Donington, and then we came, when we came in the 80s, they played a few shows with us, uh, you know, the Lemoors and things like that, and um, um, the Agora Bowl and thing on the West Coast. So yeah, they did a lot of, quite a bit of touring around with us, and uh, yeah, a great band. Billy, my, my partner, my then partner, he, he wanted a bit, you know, he, it was like the fifth Beatle, but my partner, it was more of caretaking. He went on the road, but he enjoyed going on the road with them. He enjoyed hanging with them. And and so if you call that management, I mean, nobody, nobody 
was a manager in the, in the true sense of management. Canada. First time for ride in Canada. Wow, we are going to Canada right now. Oh, fuck. <laughs> this is really Canada. What do you think? Yeah, I think today is my birthday. Is so so, so cool because I'm playing. I'm go playing right two now. games with my band Riot Five uh, you know, in two countries I'm not sure on my birthday. Detroit, Rock City, and now home of the Maple Leafs, Toronto. Beautiful. That's nice gorgeous water. water. It's like That's clear. Wow. What's up with that? Donnie, clear? get the view. Don't look at your phone. Look at this. Why is the water clean here? Look to your left. Oh my god. Yeah, the Canadian border. I won't yeah. worry about anything. We're going to handle our shit and go. Uh, Here we go. Washington, the moment of truth. Washington State. I've been through. Uh, no, we go through like Washington State and then we go through. Uh, Saginaw, Michigan? Uh, going to Wisconsin. Getting Indiana, pulled over. Uh, we're gonna be here for a while. Yeah. Okay, they've approved us. We're good to go. Forward into Canada on the way to Toronto for the show tonight. Woo! You got it, man. Right. right. <laughs> I'm the last shot, too. Really? I'm the last shot. Go like this guy. Oh, look at the shit. Sorry, go ahead. I did it. The band was pretty hot at that time. We had uh, well rehearsed, coming off the road. Uh, so there's a lot of energy. There was, uh, it was a new band too because we had Sandy and Kip in the band now, and the chemistry was just, just right. It, it's one of those moments where you get a group of guys together and it just clicks there's a certain vibe the material was really really good it was it was good material there was good energy they reformed and sandy slavin took peter's place um kip lemming took uh jimmy's place jimmy jimmy went off and got married so that was that was really what happened there uh we would work on material on our own, at least I did. The, the songs I contributed, I worked on my own. Um, Guy and Mark, Mark would get together and and work a material. Guy wrote all the lyrics uh, for the songs he and uh, Mark wrote. We'd get together at Mark's house and uh, work on the ideas there, basically. And, and piece them together and rehearse them. Yeah. Let's see what the light's like. Hey, what's happening? Yeah, yeah. There was a pack sitting downstairs. Martin! Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Good. <laughs> and I had met... Uh, Salisbury Cathedral, right here. Robert Lord Hungerford, born, who knows, died, 
1459. Ed Leffler was managing Sammy Hagar. Ed Leffler uh, saw use in Ryan um, because Sammy had the wrong record when he went to England. On, on you know, he had done a softer record, and then he saw the uh, the the new wave of British heavy metal scene was happening, and he knew that having toured with Riot in Texas a couple of times, he knew Riot was like of that ilk. He knew Riot fit into that same scene. Well, I had a couple of friends talking about Riot, you know. They go, uh, man, have you heard Riot? Yeah, they're going to blow off San Hager off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> they go, yeah, Riot, Riot, Riot. I think so. <laughs> Basically, Capital, as a, as a favor to Ed Leffler and to Sammy Hager, says, all right, we'll sign this band. They kind of go against their will. It's a little too heavy for them. They don't really want to do anything with this band. Um, but they signed this band, so two Capital acts are touring together in the UK. He had Capital sign the band under the understanding that, that Riot would agree to go back to England with Sammy and do all and open up for Sammy on all those dates. It's a really accurate sundial. Supposed to uh, point to the equinox. Some people believe that people from another planet or the last si lost city of Atlantis uh, built this. Then we came back and we thought, you know, we're, we're home free now, we can just record. So Narita comes out, um, they've got this deal with Capital, and um, what happens is that, um, you know, People ask, like, like, you know, why, why did they have these problems with Capital? What did, what did Capital do with this record? Capital kind of buried this record. They didn't, they didn't really work it. Um, it was released in the UK a little bit under duress, and in the States they were kind of ignoring it. So what Steve went and did was he did something that, that's uh, quote unquote, in his words, embarrassed the label. Billy and myself were doing uh, commercials, and we had enough money to buy. A radio, independent radio promotion guys. So we had enough money to put the record on the Capitol record, on radio. What happened is uh, it, the record kind of had a minor blow up. It, it did well in radio um, and Capitol was kind of embarrassed by this whole situation. And then they were kind of shamed into picking up the option for another record. We, we delivered the next record, Five Down Under, and they said, we don't want it. Our question was why they said it's commercially, it's commercially unacceptable. Um, Capital came to Riot and was kind of making signals that they wanted them to be a little more commercial. Mark Reale says in, uh, in in my book, actually, he's, he's told me personally that um, you know they said, oh, well, you know, what do you guys feel about wearing makeup and things like this? So. The band had actually tried, as Mark says to me, uh, he says, we did make an attempt to make some more commercial songs. Um, but then basically Steve kind of got in, in fighting mode and said, you know, you guys, this is not you. You guys just got to be who you are. And then, and then, of course, the question became, OK, well, let us go. And they said, nope. And we said, well, how do we get out of the deal? And they said, sue us. I, I, we flew in uh, um, British journalists, so we did, there was a cover story on sounds, uh, uh, the English sounds uh, newspaper, and that caused the, the petitions in England. And they were petitioning in front of the Hammersmith Odeon and, 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 and various venues. And it, and it escalated from there, it escalated everywhere. It escalated in England, you know, and in Europe with fans. The UK caught wind of this whole story because of these UK journalists going over and people like Neil Kay and Jeff Barton. Um, they, they had gotten wind that Capital was not wanting to put out this new Riot album and they had put together a petition 
uh, that that they were going to get you know all the punters, all the new wave of British heavy metal kids to sign to say, you know, either put this album out as is the heavy album we want uh, that we're hearing about, or uh, release this band from their uh, from their contract. So by the spring of uh, '81, it was pretty obvious that Capital had no intention of releasing Far Down Under. So uh, Bill Abel, who was part of Riot's management team, got in touch with uh, John Kibble in London, who was a pal of mine. Both he and I were huge Riot fans uh, back then, and uh, he knew a few other guys, and uh, he said, look, can we maybe organise a petition? Uh, we're going to try and lobby Capital, get the album released that way. So yeah, we got forms together, we printed forms off, went to record stores, went to gigs. I remember going to Motorhead show. And I got a bunch of signatures there, and uh, I think ultimately we probably ended up with 4,000 signatures or so. But uh, they went back to Bill in uh, New York, who took them along with his legal team to Capitol Tower in Hollywood, and uh, the rest to say is history. The, uh, so the fans saved the band. There's no, there's no question. Without the fans, the band, I mean, the, the record cut, the labels got, were, became fearful. There were two reasons why Capitol let the band go in the end. One was that reason where they were getting a lot of heat from EMI in, 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 in Europe and England, especially in England. And the second one was because fans from Southern California were, were, were riding up to, to the Capitol building up in LA and they were spray painting. <laughs> they were spray painting the, car, the Capitol executive cars. Um, so all of these forces came down upon Capitol and, and basically they were uh, essentially shamed out of uh wanting to you know get rid of this band that they didn't even want anyways and so fire down under uh comes out on electric donnie lap park today here we are again we brought a friend with us rock. so i don't know who this guy is not just a hang around where are we tell us where we are What's we up? are in the new otani hotel in tokyo Ready to play. Now searching park. for. All set to go down to Loud Park. <laughs> Taking a few photos with the uh, fans. Uh, I don't. I don't think you know that we knew that it was. It was good. We knew that. We knew that the songs were good. Uh, we knew that the playing was good, um, and we hoped it was it was to be well received. The band would record all together in the studio, like the basics, the basic track. So it was recorded as a unit, and they all could feed the, they all could feed off their each other's energy. So we really pumped it, <laughs> pumped it out. I mean, we just went in there, and a lot of stuff was first takes. Then when we went to uh, various the various leads, Mark, you know, Mark is a was a was a really underrated guitar player. He was an amazing, amazing, amazing guitar player. Ricky was a completely different player than Mark. Mark was a real fluid player. Ricky did. Ricky was not that kind of a player. He was he was more quirky. But 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 very extremely creative. It was it was it was wonderful to record them. The the, the rhythm section, Kip and Sandy were as tight as can be. They were really really tight, and they were and they were terrific. Uh, Fire down under. I think uh, the Deep Riot fans just consider it a uh, a better album, possibly better production, a little more aggressive. Um, it's got some of their bigger hits on it. Looking back, uh, many years later, I started to realize how good it was and how it influenced some other other bands and it still holds up today so that really you know that blows me away that you know sometimes it takes many years for, to really hit home and the first time that i really heard uh, the fire down under album i was really really impressed with the songwriting I was impressed with the guitar playing, don't get me wrong, I thought the guitar playing was great and I also thought uh, Guy Speranza's vocals were very, were very good. I actually met Mark Rialli in 1981. Uh, it was through a mutual friend of ours, uh, Ricky Warheit, who was the uh, head of the street team for Riot in San Antonio, Texas at the time. 
So uh, Mark would come down to visit. He didn't like the cold New York weather. He liked the uh, warm weather of Texas. And so he would come down and uh, he liked to jog and run and stuff like that. So uh, he would come down and stay with Rick sometimes. And uh, while he was down here, um, he would want to keep his chops up. So Ricky asked if uh, he knew of any bands or you know, players that would uh, want to get together and jam and stuff. So uh, the Texas Slayer I was in at the time uh, was uh, rehearsing in Rick's garage. So Mark came in and that's when we met him in the garage. And so we would uh, just play riot songs, uh, some Slayer stuff, just jam. Oh, I ate with him at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm <laughs> Mr. Rick Ventura. <laughs> There were grumblings on the road that Guy was was unhappy, not with the band, he was unhappy doing it. I went to see a, a show uh, in New Jersey at the Brendan Byrne Arena. That was a, I think it was a Rush show. So it was, it was packed. And when I saw them perform, I realized we had a major problem because what was occurring was was called it's called negative promotion. The band the band would play and and the sales would die. Guy was just not comfortable up there. He was not comfortable. Uh, a bit devastating. We were we were shocked. Um, we tried our best to persuade him to stay. Uh, I I think he might have wanted maybe just to settle down and be a bit more secure. Um, financially, and I, mean, I think he wanted to be a, a family man, and I think he was just f frustrated with the band not making it. You know, he kind of surprised us all. We were on tour with, uh, actually, with uh, on the Rush, the Rush Moving Pictures tour at the time when it happened, and everything was going great for us. We had uh, entered the top 100 for the first time in our career in Billboard and uh, on the albums chart and, and Electric picked up our option and everything was going great and we were on one of the best tours at the time and he just decided that he had had it. Um, we don't really know the reason, uh, you know, uh, I just think maybe he was he had a lot of real bad insecurities that I think the actual, when, when success actually started to come, I think maybe he, you know, was a little taken back by it, maybe, you know, couldn't handle it. And then at the same time, he got married. You know, you think you want something, and then, you know, when, when the reality of, of the success and the responsibility really hits you in the face, it's like a whole nother, a whole nother deal, and I think that kind of shocked him. Uh, he left the band, I think, after the third album for, you know, personal reasons and family reasons. You know, a lot of people say it's religious reasons or, you know, whatever is out there, but uh, in 2011, I went and uh, I spoke with the guy's wife and his family and Jimmy and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, they really mistreated the guy and he was just sick of it. And the guy just had enough of it, didn't want to be part of it anymore. And, and Mark was crushed. First and foremost, which is what I, I saw, and, I, and then later he told me, and then later Mark told me, was that uh, he never wanted to do it in the first place. Never wanted to. Before's free my soul, I don't wanna get lost in your rock and roll and drift away. Give me the beat, boys, free my soul, I don't wanna get lost in your rock and roll and drift. 
the way Give me the beat, boys, and free my soul I don't want to get lost in your rock and roll And drift away Two alternatives. One alternative is to do what everyone normally does, which is find sound alike. I mean, that's what you do. You you, ha you have a certain sound, that sound was working, so you try to recreate that sound. The other the other way was sort of almost the kiss of death. This is this is the insane route, and uh, and and you go out and you and you and you don't care about a sound alike. Now now what you try to do is you try to cure all the ills that you knew existed. Guys, limited range, for instance. Now it could cure. Now we could cure the problems he had live on the road. We could cure. The Rent Forester area is kind of funny in, in the Riot Canon because they were on such a high with Fire Down Under, which was universally hailed as a as a uh, as a genius bit of modern heavy metal. But with Rhett, what happened was they kind of toned it back a little bit, got a little Paul Rogers and Bad Company ish. Uh, they had some covers on there, and they were pushing those covers as as the uh, as the big songs from the records. So again, this was Riot being kind of out of step with the times, not particularly ahead of their time at this at this point. But this was when hair metal in uh, California was really starting to rise, and we got. Quiet Riot and Rat and Motley Crue and Doc and starting to take off and Van Halen in their mature period. But basically, um, we have these records that uh, that seem out of step with everything else, and uh, you know they they were basically penalized for it. Red Forrester came into Riot, and all of a sudden, Riot for me became much more intense. His vocal delivery, his bluesy heavy edge, really added added a bunch of stuff to the Riot sound. Guy Sprinza, God bless him, fantastic singer, but with Red came in, it just changed things for me for the better. My first impression when uh, Guy left and, and uh, Red came in, I was friends with Mark then, and it was a little strange. I think a, a lot of the Riot fans were the, had the same feelings as me. Um, you go from such an iconic record like Fire Down Under, because you're going like, man, how can they top, you know, Rock City, Narita, holy cow, how can they top those two? Fire Down Under, you're like, oh my god. And then, when Restless Breed came out, they get this southern rocker from Atlanta, Georgia, and Mark was playing me demos, and uh, he was like, hey, you know, we got a new singer. I'm like, dude, what happened to the guy? And family stuff, and this and that. and strong Italian family he was from, so he said the family really didn't want him to do it anymore. It's the bad one making a comfortable living. And so, uh, you know, uh, they had to get someone else, and Mark just kind of did the extreme and, and went for this guy. And I remember the first time he played it for me, being a Riot fan, I was like going, what the hell are you doing? What are you thinking? It was totally opposite. The Red Forester's um, rock star character, it really is not an exaggeration to say that Rhett lived life on the edge. He was really like the ultimate rock star or like in the movie, uh, Almost Famous. He was kind of like the golden god. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Rhett would walk out of the house wearing leather pants and full rock star regalia at like 11 in the morning. Of course, he was never really up at 11 in the morning, so it was more like one in the afternoon when he was up. On stage, um, you could see that Guy didn't really have a command, so to speak, of, of the crowd. And, you know, immediately when Red came into the picture, in stage presence, that you can feel, I mean, on stage, you can feel it. It's like when you when you walked in on stage, there was this focal point, you know, there was like, you know, when Guy was there, it was just like a bunch of guys running around on the stage, you know, basically. With Red, it was, it was like a definite focal, focal point there, and, and that was one of the major things that, that we noticed immediately when he came into the picture. Well, Red was a character. I mean, he was this guy that, you know, he used to drink his, his Bud Tall 16 ounces. He used to, um, you know, he was just the real deal. He lived life exactly like like a rock star. I mean, this guy was the epitome of that. From his moves on stage to his voice, he was a very soulful singer, very soulful hard rock singer with a lot of flair and a lot of style. And his personality was larger than life. But one thing about Rhett, the man could deliver. He was on point and he knew how to hold a crowd, you know, whether it was in a club or a big, you know, a big outdoor festival. And I've seen him in, in all of those settings. 
And who chose Red Forrester? Mark chose Red Forrester. Red had already been out there and auditioned for a number of a number of people, and they they passed. All of that stuff with other people passing was going. That baggage that Red had was now going to become part of Riot's bag. But Mark loved that style. Now we had so now we had this this sort of bad company guy with baggage that was nightmarish to record because he. You had he had a drink when he was recording, and if you if you drank when you were recording, you only had a limited amount of takes in you, and then that was the end of it. Rhett could probably drink anybody under the table. Uh, he was not a drunk though. He was not. He did not get sloppy. He did not get stupid. He did not get mean. One summer, he stayed at my house uh, in Huntington, Long Island. And I'll always remember that um, Rhett could literally wake up at the crack of noon, which he usually did, and, and start polishing off a six pack. The Restless Breed album came out of the gate with songs like CIA, the intense Lone Shark, the intense Hard Loving Man. The title track Restless Breed was an epic, a fantastic, fantastic cover of When I Was Young, uh, and as well as showdown which was the hit in Virginia on the radio for us it got them a little bit of airplay they went out they played with a bunch of bands they were on tour they were still known as Riot this great rock and roll band from America Restless Weed is a great Riot album and Brett brings so much to that album and in particular one of the songs that I remember is uh, Hard Loving Man and if I recall correctly it's a long time ago so don't uh, hold me to it but I believe he actually bought that song with him into Riot. I think he was doing that song before when Rhett was in the band Hitman, which was kind of a kind of a, a regional band that Rhett fronted. The reaction on the road was like, okay, well, there's always two camps. And it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's not Riot because it's not Guy. And then you have some fans that thought the Restless Breed period was the best period, so it's all over the place. We got to know um, Johnny Z, who was Craze Management, um, same guy that kind of discovered Metallica and uh, Anthrax. And it, we did a show in 1982 in October of that year. The, it was called the uh, Headbangers Halloween bash or whatever <laughs> and it was put on by Rock and Roll Heaven which is Johnny Z which is part of Mega Forest Records and uh, we did that show with with Riot and Raven which was quite memorable and fantastic and I went to see Riot when they played the, the Halloween uh, night in I think it was 1982 and it was uh, it was Raven, Anvil and Riot was headlining the show so the way that went down is Riot, you know, everybody in New York knew Riot. And I was there up front and, um, you know, I was in there and actually Rhett held out the mic and I sang into the mic one of the songs. I think it was probably uh, Warrior. And um, later on, you know, a few months later, I was actually hanging out and came in contact with Rhett because I would hang out in the city and I would, New York City, and I, I would come in contact with Rhett um, so we became friends. I got to know Mark, um, fantastic guitar player. Oh, he's terrific, great guy. Uh, he was about a year older than me. Um, we had a lot in common. I, I guess we liked a lot of the same music. And very, very influential band. Um, not much different in the sense of coming out in the late 70s and early 80s like Anvil did. and. We laid the, the foundation for whatever was to come after it. Yes, it was called hard rock or heavy rock at the time, and it, within a couple of years, all of a sudden, it was heavy metal. How did Restless Breed do? Oh, that's a very interesting question, because Restless Breed had what they call a turntable hit, Showdown. It was a, it was a, a full-fledged turntable hit, meaning tons of play, no sales, no sales.
them dearly. Great people. Um, they never disappoint when we go over there. Um, as you've probably seen, we played the great stadiums for Loud Park uh, with the biggest bands. So um, the country's beautiful, the people are beautiful, the food's beautiful, you know, and uh, when they come to see the band, uh, they do it large, like this Loud Park. There's thousands of people here. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but we love Japan, you know, and the feeling's mutual, you know. Keep going. When they went on the road to see Rhett perform, it was, it was, it was close to spectacular. And the record company, they didn't support it. They had, they had, they had no belief in that record. They, they were, they wanted, they wanted the sound to like, and they thought that, that Rhett was so far off the beaten path that they quickly lost interest in it. And, and, and Motley Crue had now signed to Elektra and that became sort of a pet project. And that was the end, of, that was pretty much the end of Riot and Elektra. First time I heard Riot was my buddy Mark's place when we were younger, early 80s. Uh, he slaps on Born in America. I mean, every song in that album is a jewel, uh, starting with the opening track, the title track, going into stuff on Wings of Fire. Uh, and then you got the, the Cliff Richard cover of Devil Woman, which they really rocked it up. You got Gunfighter in Side B, where Soldier Who, Vigilante Killer, it's just a great album. Every track, and uh, of course with uh, Rhett Forrester, who was a, you know, a rock god, potential rock god. For pre-production for Born in America, Mark would uh, jam with me, Dave McLean, and Steve Cooper, which later became the Rita. Uh, he would go over the ideas and I would sit with him and actually help co-write uh, Gunfighter, uh, Wings of Fire, what else was there, Heavy Metal Machine and Running From The Law. We actually have demos of the Narita band doing those. He would take the cassette back in the day and to the guys and basically they would listen to it and learn the songs. Born in America was an awful experience. It was an awful experience. The record was done terribly. Um, it wasn't the band's fault. The, the 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 fault of that was is that my my ex my former late partner was having a, a, a fights. I mean, we lost the label. The, I was I had lost a tremendous amount of money. Um, I refused to work with him. He refused to work with me. So we were recording the we were recording the album twice separately. In, you know, on separate occasions. I would never be in the studio with him, he'd never be in the studio with me. And we could have ended that. That could have been solved. That's another thing we can thank Mark for. Mark refused to do that. I asked him to do it, and he refused to do it. He refused to walk away. I said, you gotta, you gotta choose, because this is insane. He wouldn't choose between, between me or Billy. And Rhett grew on me. You know, at first I was kind of okay, and then when I started hearing Hard Loving Man, I was like, wow, you know, I started hearing these great songs, and I was like, it's a switch, but in the Great Riot tradition of good music, it's great music, so everybody accepted it and stuff like that, and uh, so I loved Rip Forster, and that was my actual, uh, uh, when I joined Riot, he was, you know, he was still in the band. I got to play with the great Sandy Slavin, Rip Forster, the original lineup when I first got in the band, and I was actually Rip Forster's roommate. When we toured, they put us together, and I lived with them on Sunset and Larrabee, uh, off the Strip in California for a year, and great, great, great guy. A little weird at first, but turned into be a great thing, so. They followed us up with a quick live EP on the Electra uh, Asylum uh, label, and that was also well received. It showed them on their live side, which took some of that production of the Wrestle Spree away, and made it that much more vicious, a cool piece. They later surfaced again for Born in America, which had a different record label. The quality records is the one we got under with the uh, crazy artwork on the cover, like all the right covers, crazy artwork. The record was a brilliant, brilliant piece of uh, material. The title track, Born in America, got an MTV play on it. So cool. How could you not like that track? You Burning Me is probably my favorite on there. Gunfighter is another really good one. Heavy Metal Machines also really well uh, done. This song, uh, Born in America, from the same album, Born in America, I, when I first heard it, I thought, you know, this is like a great answer song to uh, Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA. O only, of course, uh, 
with Red singing, it had a lot more balls than the Springsteen song. But more than that, I felt the whole album, Born in America, was also kind of an answer to all this great metal that was coming out of Europe. And it was Riot uh, saying to the world, hey, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of America as well. And of course, I had my band Virgin Steel at that time. And we had bands like Manowar and The Rods and uh, Raven. Well, actually, Raven was British, but Manowar, The Rods and, and so on. And, uh, and Metallica was actually coming out around that time as well. So I felt Born in America was kind of like a, a defiant statement uh, from Riot about, hey, America is no slouch either in the metal world. I, we spent a lot of time on the record, but the record, and the record, I mean, the record didn't do badly. It, it didn't do badly, and there, and there was a video we did, but the video stuff nobody was paying for. There was, there were no gigs. I mean, there were gigs, but they were, they were sort of put together gigs no label and it was just it, it all fell apart there that's that's where it all ended and that was the end of it and i, I mean it was it was it that was also not, it was nightmarish because it was nothing but a dream it was like i had to come up with money like every week every week every week every week and there was no return there was no future it didn't look like there was any future now so now the band band breaks up and it's gone the band's gone for years. Yeah. 